Forty years ago, in the summer of 1955, Hollywood came to the small West Texas town of Marfa to make a film about Texas and Texans. It was a Western, but not your typical cowboy shoot 'em up. It was a modern Western that did for Texas what Gone with the Wind did for Georgia, spawning an attitude and a state of mind that colors many perceptions to this day. It has been called the national movie of Texas. The film was giant. At the turn of the century, cattle was king. But in 1901, oil was struck at Spindletop and the Texas oil millionaire was born. This new class of Texans caught the public's fancy with their gambler's attitude and their ability to throw away money. The man who personified this attitude was Houston's Glenn McCarthy. Born dirt poor, he hit it big and used the money to build his own hotel, the Shamrock, at a cost of 21 million in 1949 dollars. The opening of the Shamrock landed McCarthy on the cover of Time magazine. It was against this mythic backdrop that the best-selling author Edna Ferber decided to write her next novel. When Edna Ferber published her novel, uh, Giant, in 1952, she was a well-known national writer, and she was sort of a pre-James Michener type in that she would locate a, a book in a particular place. She would go there and spend some time, do a little research, and construct a plot. You know, when Ferber wrote her book, uh, not every Texan was that wild about the story. Edna Ferber's novel uh, exploited, uh, uh, portrayed and exploited uh, every Texas stereotype there is. The big bragging uh, oil man, the uh, exploitive uh, rancher, the larger-than-life blowhard. There was lots of criticism of, of uh, Edna Ferber, a sense that she had betrayed some of the people that she had talked to on her actual visits to Texas. But what Texans were probably most bothered about was the unflattering portrait of the state. They weren't keen about some of that criticism about the racial aspects. It did deal with issues. It wasn't just a, a glossy boy meets girl, they have get married and have children story. George Stevens gets interested in that property and in 1955 he goes out to Marfa to shoot Giant. George Stevens ha has a reputation, you know, I mean, he at that time he had a huge reputation as being a, a, a great, fantastic picture maker, filmmaker. He loved his work. I mean, he loved the idea of telling a story. And in Giant, you know, he saw an opportunity to have a big canvas and deal with a lot of themes that were interesting to him. And he imposed some themes on the Edna Ferber book. The word just got about that, that this was something very special going on in Marfa, Texas. When you talked about a uh, movie, uh, a movie cast and crew coming up out there to make a movie, it was like uh, saying that someone was coming from Mars, you know, to uh, visit a while. These, these people were coming from an entirely different world. When it was learned that the movie that was going to be filmed there was giant, there was a little nervousness about it. People were wondering about how their life, their way of life was going to be portrayed in the movie. My father had a kind of compassion and again I would say a sensibility um, that was not going to allow him to make a harsh or mean or bitter or sarcastic picture. In 1955, Warner Brothers announced that it would begin filming Giant with legendary director George Stevens directing and co-producing. A huge scouting search was launched to find the site that best represented Texas. After sending his scouts all over Texas, George Stevens decided that the location for Giant would be Marfa, a small cattle town located on the edge of the Big Bend. Tonight I'm gonna to tell you about a town, a town with a story of its own in which this script plays a momentary part. 50 days in a history of over 105 years. Now, most of you probably haven't even heard of this town. And I'm sure that the people who live there won't feel insulted if I say it's not exactly a metropolis. It's... there. Presidio County is a, a vast space. I mean, it's, it has 3,892 square miles. And that's bigger than four or five states. 
Uh, so you can get in your truck and drive for two hours and never cross the county line. You're talking about a, a great deal uh, of territory. So we were very few people roaming around in a sea of land out there. We're so remote from any broadcast stations, and to this day, you can't put an antenna in the air and pick up any TV in Marfa, Texas. The nearest TV station is 190 miles away. It was uh, very much like growing up on the frontier in many ways. Well, Hollywood has had this sense that Texas is one of the unique places in this country. There aren't that many places anymore that have a unique feel to them. Texas is still one of those places. When that Hollywood company, Warner Brothers, w went out to Marfa, they were going out to a place that must have seemed to them both at once familiar and at once exotic. Because here was a place that they had ideas about from having seen films. They knew what cowboys were. They'd seen films about cowboys. And here they were in a place where there were real cowboys. They was called all of the agencies in wanting to see the real Texans. I don't want to see anybody if they're not born and raised in Texas and they can ride a horse and this and that. So I'm, I come up on that list right quick, you know. Well, you know, I was 19 years old, and uh, uh, James Dean and I had just finished Rebel Without a Cause. And uh, George Stevens had hired me to play in Giant. So we all came down on the train from Los Angeles. There was a part for our Texas heiress in the movies. And so uh, Rock, I think, said he wanted me. He had a lot to do with it. And I went out and did a screen test, and I got the part. When George Stevens was looking for locations, this was before he decided to go to Marfa. Uh, he was running a lot of Western films to look at their locations where they had been shot. And when he saw Broken Lance, which we'd shot in Nogales, New Mexico, um, he didn't like the location especially, but he said to an assistant who was sitting next to him, when he watched me do a scene, he says, when I do, when we shoot, I want to use that boy. Chill Wills always used to call me and say, hey, Monts, what are you doing? I said, not a lot, Chill. He says, come on, ride over with me. So I rode over with him. I had a cowboy hat on, kind of like this. We went into George Stevens' office, and I hung my hat up on a rack there, and I was just sitting back there waiting for Chill to get through, you know, interviewing with George. George Stevens' wife had seen me on this first big television show that I'd done and recommended me to George. As I'd never been on film before, George uh, put me on film to see how I did, and it was, it was a wonderful experience, even the screen test. And so when we started to leave, I picked my hat up off of the rack and put it on my head with one hand. So I went home, and the next morning I had a telephone call from the casting director from Warner Brothers saying that Mr. Stevens wanted to see me, and I thought, my goodness, what for? And uh, I went over there, and they told me, they says, he liked the way you put your hat on when you left the office, he, just with one hand. He said, you put, he said, you didn't hold it like this. He said, you just grabbed it and put it on, and he liked the way you did that. So I got a six-month job with Mr. Stevens on Giant, and I didn't do a lot in Giant, but uh, I got even with a preacher. <laughs> George is talking to me, he said, uh, Texas Disney, oh, he's just a yabbing down. He said, do you think you could teach Rock Hudson to talk like you do? And I kind of cocked my head and I looked at him, I said, what? He said, do you think you could teach Rock Hudson to talk like you do? I said, man, I've been going to a speech coach over there trying to lose his Texas accent. He said, oh, no, no. He said, if you can teach Rock Hudson to talk like you do, he said, I'll give you a part on the picture and says, you'll have a run of the whole picture. I said, yes, sir, I can teach him to talk like I do. I was, let's see, 1955, I was uh, 29, I think. Because he had made so many excellent, perfect films, I think, that to work with him, get a chance to work with him, um, was really something for me. Plus, the role itself was a pretty good role to have. And at last, dropping down from the Texas sky come the stars of Giant, the people who will turn all the weeks of preparation into an act of artistic creation. Out of the special chartered plane stepped Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, director George Stevens.
Yeah, we went down on a train, a whole bunch of us. We went to, let's see, we went down to, through El Paso and everything, and I think we got off at Valentine. And then we were driven on through, onto the ranch, and we stayed at the Paisana Hotel in Marpa. Marpa was a booming little town back then anyway. We had close to 5,000 people, and over 100 businesses here, and the ranching industry was the main attraction about the town, and we were, we were pretty active back then. And there were lots of things going on, but nothing like a movie. When the Warner Brothers army of cast and crew came to Marfa, they took over the town. Every available hotel room was commandeered. The stark landscape, distant mountains, and endless skies of Marfa gave Stevens everything he wanted for Riata, the Benedict's ranch. Everything except the house. The illusion of the Riata, a facade, a false front, was constructed on the Worth Evans Ranch. In all of his films, he had this uh, you know, sense of the visual. And I think one of the most uh, crucial decisions in Giant was his selection of that plain outside of Marfa, Texas, where he built that big Gothic house. Well, on the big house we had in Marfa, it was a three-sided house. And there wasn't any rugs or anything inside. Chill Will said to me one day, he says, hey, Munch. He says, come in here. This is all wall-to-wall -wall dirt. He says, I'm telling you, he says, this is big. It came down here on six flat cars. And you can see they come in here and set these big telephone poles to build the house around. And the, the owner lived over here. His name was, uh, the house on the left, that was uh, Worth Evans's house. Clay lives in the one to the right now. That's his new house. Well, I was in school at Tech, and uh, some people, California people contacted my dad in California, and they knew he had property out in Texas. So they, they came out here, and my brother showed them around, and they picked this location. I didn't know it was Texas. I mean, I'm used to green grass and trees and all that good stuff and I saw this place I was kind of like Liz was when she first opened the shade and looked out of the Pullman and said where are we I, I, I couldn't believe that they had picked Marfa as the place to film but it turned out perfectly wonderful the movie culture of the period was so unlike most anything else in America during that time. It was larger than life in a very real, literal sense. It was larger than life. The fact that a movie company would blow out here, bringing with them that aura of power, of anything is possible, of, of, of we are the people who can do anything, take you anywhere, make you think anything, create whole different worlds for you on the screen. And it converged with the Texas mythology, which was not only a myth, but in fact a reality. It surrounds us here. I'll never forget that shot of when, when Dick Benedict gets, takes his bride off that train, this beautiful, lovely creature, this soft, delicate thing from, from Virginia, and puts her in the car, and off they go through the gate of, of Riata. And you know, the camera pulls up, and you see all that nothing but dust, and nothing but just miles of, 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 of nothing. Uh, that, that, that's one of the shots that really hangs in my head. This is it, honey. This is your home. But it's huge. I, I thought it was a ranch house. Jet is Vic's new wife. Leslie's boy here is Jet Rink. No. Works for us. The storyline of Giant is about change. Change brought on by oil money. The oil baron of Giant is Jet Rink, played by James Dean, a poor ranch hand who wins the audience's affection early on as he suffers one abuse after another from the lordly Benedicts. Ain't nobody king in this country. Despite his reputation in Hollywood for being moody 
and difficult, Dean soon became the local favorite. In short, James Dean became a good old boy. Well, the very first one that we met was James Dean there at the Paisano. That uh, He was just arriving when we got there, and uh, he was uh, in blue jeans, and he was with Dennis Hopper. Jimmy Dean had this uh, little giggle that real, real, real sexy like it. He would really let you know, you know, that he was and that he was enjoying our interview with him. It was about three or four different times when he was in the eating breakfast. They let us go into the dining room and he would have breakfast and we'd go in there and, and shoot some of the pictures while he was eating and he'd tell us what he was having and he was just real, real friendly. Some of my girlfriends and I got together and decided we'd have a little dinner party and we would invite him. And he very graciously accepted. He just didn't realize he was going to be the only guy there. <laughs> so he wasn't inclined to stay so long, so we all kissed him goodnight and let him go home. <laughs> People would think that he was uh, moody, but no, he was not moody. He was uh, acting his scene because he wanted to be one of the best actors. And he told me personally, I'm going to show Hollywood what the actor is. Jimmy copied a lot of things from Clay, little mannerisms and different things, you know, and from other people around. He wanted to be a Texan, and he really studied it. And uh, I think, you know, it, most of these people thought he was a pretty good old boy, didn't they? Jimmy? Yeah. Yes, they thought he was fine. Giant was filmed on an open set, which meant that there might be as many as 300 people watching a scene as it was shot. And usually when they do a big picture for stars like that, they just shut off the set. It's a closed set. But down here, they welcomed them. Boy, they just passed out circulars and everything. It was really fabulous. You know, George Stevens was nice about having outsiders come in and watch them film. You know, we had big crowds from all over that heard that we were there. They would come in in droves. I mean, just they, they would keep them back, but they could see what we were doing. Well, the one time that I remember most is that famous scene that everybody was in, you know, the barbecue scene, and I think everybody in West Texas was there for that, either, either participating in it or watching it being filmed. The best food you ever ate, honey. This is real Mexican barbacoa. That's where we get the word barbecue. Wherever you had a shade, this is where you eat with a, a tablecloth under the tables and this is what the star and the director and the producer said. And George Stevens had a huge, huge, almost like a circus tent. And he fed anybody and everybody that came out there. His idea was, I want people to see this movie being made. They will be my ambassadors. So every now and then one of the stars, usually Rock Hudson or uh, James Dean, would come over and talk to members of the of the watching crowd and sign uh, autographs and pose for snapshots and all that. And George liked that because what he wanted to do, he tried to create as much goodwill as possible down here. He wanted everybody down here to go back home and tell everybody about Giant. But the good citizens of Marfa did more than just watch a motion picture being made. Our casting director saw to that. Of Marfa's 4,000 people, 150 got a chance to do something right at home that most of us have to go to Hollywood for. They got a chance to act in a picture. And what a picture. It was the scene where uh, I believe Earl Holloman was playing the part and he was returning to the ranch. And our band was, was there as part of the greeting for him. And I was a majorette at the time. And I'm standing there twirling two batons. I have on a little purple and white band uniform. And, uh, they paid our band enough money that we were able to purchase a really special piece of equipment. And if I'm not mistaken, it was a bass horn. And back in those days, our school budget wasn't all that big, so that was really a big asset for us. And those of us that were in the band and in the movie that day felt like we'd really made a contribution. So one day I had 20 feet of rope out like this with a knot on the end of it. And I was throwing loops down it, and the knot would jump through and tie a knot. And James Dean stood there, and he says, could you teach me to do that? I says, I have an idea. Let me get behind you and hold your arms. And I says, just hold your arms limber. And I says, I'll do the work. So I did that for him. We tied some knots like that with me coaching. 
And he got to learning to do that, and I said, now use it in a scene in this picture. My favorite scene uh, is real easy. My favorite scene is the, uh, the scene where Jet Rink decides not to take, the, I think it was $600, instead of the small parcel of land that was left to him. And the way the good old boys took him in the room and invited him into their inner circle and uh, commented on how much money that was, and he went along with them and said, oh, yeah, that's a lot of money. And uh, he led him to believe that he was going to take it. And then, of course, he was smart. And part of the Texas legend and something that all of us know inherently from being born and raised here is the idea that land is more important than anything else. And if you can obtain some, you need to hold on to it. It's a real bad wind that doesn't blow somebody some good. <laughs> Amen. Well, Monty Hale's chewing on a cigar and, you know, just making it flop all over catching flies and picking his nose and things in the background and Bob Nichols was all fell over on the couch with his legs and thrown up like this and they're all talking and Jimmy said man he said this is tough he said Rock's got all the dialogue the good dialogue and he said I don't have a damn thing to do he said what am I going to do in there now she wanted to give you something I know she did I said you know that little old rope that we've been working with you and he said I said take that in your hand I said just keep messing with it I said, everybody's going to wonder, what in the hell you got in your hand? I said, just keep messing with it. They can see that little old ball and everything. And he did. Hell, he stole the scene away from them. Well, now, to get right down to the point, Mr. Rink, we are prepared to place in your hands, in cash, the sum of $1,200. Yes, sir? Boy. <laughs> Twelve hundred dollars, which uh, any of these gentlemen here, I'm, I'm sure they'll be happy to tell you it's, uh, it's twice the value of that land. Definitely. Oh, at least twice the value of that land. <laughs> That's a lot of money, Jeff. What are you aiming to do with all of it? You're in the chips now, boy. <laughs> there it is. There it is, boy. <laughs> and it's all yours. <laughs> there it is. I don't know what to say. <laughs> she was a fine lady. Yes, yeah, she was a fine lady. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And I, I want to want you to know that I appreciate her gener uh, gen generosity. And yours too, Vic. And y'all. I sure do want to thank you for it. You know something, Vic? <clears throat> I don't know, but what just might not be a pretty good idea to gamble along with old Madama. How do you mean? Just gamble along. Just keep what she gives me. I'm sentimental too, but. Uh, I just think it's good to gamble along with her. I know that land ain't worth much, but then uh, someday I just might up and put my own fence around her. Call her a little Rietta. <laughs> 